Well, if you have your Bibles today, can you open up to Acts chapter 3? Book of Acts, we are going through verse by verse, and we are going to be in Acts chapter 3 today. Praise the Lord. Acts 3. I'm actually going to read the entire chapter, but I'm probably only going to (laughs) get to verse 10. So just want to give you a little bit of uh, of over, let's get a bird's eye view first. Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried whom they used to set down daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But when Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him, he said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them, But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. And leaping up, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God, And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were recognizing him as uh, that he was the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while he was still clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the portal called, called Solomon's, full of wonder. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, Why do you marvel at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered and denied in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you but put to death the author of life, whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witness. We are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which is through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, The Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. To him you shall listen to everything he says to you. And it shall be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his success words onward, also proclaim these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant, which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're not going to get through the whole chapter. I, had, I was actually going to be a little bit aggressive today and kind of just plow through 
But as I was praying and the Lord was kind of like, slow down, it's okay, we don't have to rush. There's a lot here in this chapter. This is significant. Remember, we've been covering Acts. Acts chapter, uh, chapter 2 is Pentecost, and, and, and the church grew, grew, started growing. 3,000 people, you know, and the Holy Spirit is sent. And, and, and now, in one sense, you know, those people that were filled and they, speak, spoke, they understand the tongues and they receive, they believe, you know, some of them went back to other parts of the world because they had been gathering at Pentecost, you know. But now it seems like at some point now, normal life is returning, so to speak, right? We don't know, uh, Luke doesn't tell us how far after Pentecost this happened. Someday, one day, uh, Peter and John happened to go, you know. This was a normal day uh, for them. Um, and it's interesting that what we're going to see here in verses 1 through 10 is the first miracle of the church. The very first miracle that happens in the church age. Now look with me, first of all, in, in, uh, in verse 1. He says, now, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. Peter and John, normally it was Peter and Andrew, James and John, right? And normally they're, they're but now you have these two guys partnered together, which you see them together in various scriptures. You see them together fishing. You see them at the Mount of Transfiguration. J Peter, James, and John are together, right? You see them at the Last Supper. Hey, John, what is he saying? <laughs> who is going to betray him? You see Peter, who has always been the one who had opened his mouth <laughs> a little bit too quickly, but he's now sort of like a leader. John is sort of more the introvert or the quiet, you know, close to, um, you know, close to Jesus, and Peter is the... And now they're partnered together, two people of opposite personalities that are working together. That's the way of the Lord, isn't it? How God can put you together with people so different than yourself and use you both in ministry or in marriage too, you know. Um, and that's a miracle of God, Amen. Uh, we'll see them working together throughout the book of Acts. And usually John does not. Usually Peter's the one that's speaking. They were going up to the temple at the ninth hour. Of course, they're going up. And of course, in Jerusalem, Mount Zion and, and the Temple Mount were the highest. They're not mountains we think of Rocky Mountains. They're sort of <laughs> more hills, but there's the highest peak. In the Temple Mount, you would go up to Temple Mount you would go, geographically you're going up, and of course there's stairs leading up to what the temple, now the temple mountain at that time is Herod's temple. Herod rebuilt uh, Zerubbabel's temple, and he made it magnificent, you know, and it's, you know, the whole thing, we are, those of us who went to Israel last year, we, we got to go on Temple Mount, it's pretty massive. We didn't see what was there at that time. Because the structures around Temple Mount, if you imagine like a trapezoid shape, it's sort of about 36 acres, that would have been a huge complex. And within that were various other things. The temple itself, and of course there was different walls and different, different structures. Along the east side of the Temple Mount was something called Solomon's Portico. And what that was, if I wish I could, I, I'll, I'll bring pictures next time was this massive corridor that was during, on the east side, the length of Temple Mount, I forget what the length is, maybe a football field or two long. And they had these massive columns on both sides. So this was a place where people would congregate or discuss things. On the, on, okay, if I'm going east, let's see, what's our direction here? Let's go, let's call this, wait, what is north? That is north. Okay. <laughs> on the east side is Solomon's portico. Here is the Mount of Olives in the Kidron Valley in the Eastern Gate. <clears throat> On this side was the Stoa, which was a, a place, a lot of things happened. I don't want to get all the details. But the point is, the temple's in here. And around the temple, there was um, the Court of the Gentiles. Okay? And there was a small wall that went around that says, basically, if you cross this and you're Gentile, you cross, you're not, if you're not Jewish, uh, you're risking your life. Okay? There was a gate, there were several gates that entered into the complex. It, the, the gate that they're going to go through, they're either going to go through this one or a different one around the corner. 
One of those is called the beautiful gate. I'll look at that in a second. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. I better slow down. They're going up to the temple, which was their custom. Look at this. Look at verse, uh, verse 1. They're going up. The Greek indicates that this wasn't something they did once a week. This is a regular thing. It was a regular thing to go to the temple at least twice a day. Because they're going up at the ninth hour, which is the hour of prayer. Now, why is that the ninth the hour of prayer? The scripture said that there would be two sacrifices that were daily, one in the morning, one at night. And oftentimes prayer would follow the sacrifice. So this was their regular routine. They're going up to have prayer. The, te- the sacrifice was going on. They go up to, 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 uh, to pray in the afternoon. This was their lifestyle. Even though, even though now they're Christians, they're still carrying on Jewish tradition of carrying on. Pr- prayer was their life. Right? Uh, that hasn't that was that wasn't uh, that that that's something that of course you know we, we learn a lesson there for to, to um, but they they go up to the temple at the ninth hour the hour of prayer the ninth hour what is that that's three p.m. so what happened was they would offer up offerings at the morning the Jewish day started at sunrise we'll call it six a.m. okay and it ended at sunset we'll call it six p.m. okay. So in the morning, they had an offering, and at the afternoon, they had an offering. Ninth hour was the 3 p.m. hour of the offering, and the prayers, the congregational prayers happened afterwards. Psalm 55 talks about three times of prayer. In the evening, morning, and noon, I will complain and murmur, and he will hear my voice. We know that Daniel prays three times a day. Perhaps he's following that rhythm um, of prayer that, that was in the law. The daily burnt offering was offered at the ninth hour at 3 p.m. But guess what else happens? Let's see what else happens at 3 p.m. Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 is going to see a vision at 3 p.m. Jesus Christ is going to be crucified. And go to, um, go to Matthew 27. Go to Matthew 27. Just, a little, just to give a little uh, context here. Matthew 27 talks about when he's being crucified... Uh, Matthew 27, uh, let's look at verse 45. It says, And now from the sixth hour, that's noon, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. And what happens at the ninth hour? At the ninth hour, verse 46, Jesus will cry out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shabakmi, my God, my God, uh, why have you forsaken me? And he's also doing other statements from the cross, like it is finished. That's at 3 p.m. What also, now this ties into the Old Testament with the Passover was killed around this time as well. So it's just the timing of this is significant. Um, this wasn't something they were going back to, go back to Acts 3. This wasn't something they were going up once in a while, by the way, this day is not going to be a Sabbath day. It's just a regular day. Why is that significant? The significance is that their, their prayer routine was daily, not just on Sundays and Saturdays. It was a daily thing. God, Paul says we are to pray without ceasing. Right? This was something normal for them to do. Amen? This was part of their lifestyle. And of course, as a, as a lesson here, of course, that's we learn from their example of that. Now verse 2. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried, whom he used to, they used to set down the, at daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who are entering the temple. Now we meet this man. He's unnamed. We don't know who he is. We'll find out in Acts chapter 4, because here's what happens. The man gets saved. Peter preaches a sermon at the rest of Acts chapter 3, and then Acts chapter 4, the, the leadership gets involved, and they don't like that this is happening. <laughs> and they found out he's 40 years old, and no doubt has been going there year after, day after day, year after year, for years. We know Jesus healed other paralytics, you know, the one man who was there for 38 years by the pool. We also know that the scripture describes there was a lot of people who needed prayer. Yet Jesus only healed that one man. 
And by the way, know that this man probably may have been aware about Jesus because Jesus would have been the temple courts teaching. That man saw, probably knew about Jesus, which tells you something. We have to be careful. In the scriptures, Jesus didn't heal everyone in the vicinity. He healed a lot of people. But the man that was paralyzed at the pool for 38 years, he got healed, but others around him didn't. We have to be careful to think that, you know, that um, to put the, uh, you know, to put the pressure that says, you know, um, we're supposed to go and do likewise. It's, it's more of this man, God has left this man here in his state for others to do ministry to him in different ways. This man is unnamed, but he doesn't need a name. And Peter and John come up to him. He's crippled. He's lame from birth. We don't know how long he lived at home before mom and dad said, hey, son, you've got to go and make it on your own. But every day, somebody had to go pick him up and had to place him there. And he's begging every single day. This is, the fact, the Greek indicates this was a habitual thing. This was... He was, he used to, this was a normal thing. I think it, and I'll get to the spiritual application in a second here, but think about this. This man is completely helpless, right? He's broken. He can't friend, he can't work, right? All he can do is beg. For him, it's been, Unless somebody comes and picks me up and places me down, unless somebody comes and puts something in my coin thing, he's helpless, and some say would say he's hopeless. I mean, I know a little bit about suffering, but I know nothing about being that man. Sometimes I've complained in my life, of, I have a hard Lord. Then I meet somebody who's, whose child has cancer. And like, I know nothing about suffering because that mom and dad are going through significant pain and suffering because their child has cancer. We know Jesus helped lame people all the time, but this man had physical difficulties, obviously. He probably had relational difficulties. He probably didn't know who his friends were other than the few people that brought him there. Relational, you know how it is. You see somebody in need. Sometimes somebody who's homeless or in need. And sometimes you're just in a busy state of mind. You pay the man no attention, right? No doubt this was a beggar that was there for a year. For, if he's 40 years old, let's figure he's there since he's 10. Let's say 30 years. Years. And maybe he's come to the places like, this is my lot in life, this is all I'm going to ever know. And it's probably true for the most part. He's not expecting anything different that day. It was another day for him. He's helpless, he's hopeless. Some say he's useless. Some might have, might, some might have judged and say, well, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born this way. Disciples ask that question of somebody who was born blind. Right? well, something must be wrong with somebody in his genealogy to make him this way. Why is he even here? He's a drain on society. He's got nothing to contribute. That's the attitude that happens in people's minds, right? And the world thinks that about unborn babies. They're just tissue. There's just a drain on mom. How selfish is that, right? And here's this man. Of course, he's not asking for any of this. But not only does he have physical difficulties and relational difficulties, obviously his financial difficulties because he's having to beg. And who knows, maybe there's some days he returns and he's got enough to buy food for the day. Maybe some days he doesn't. You want to know what it's like to, call, to live in utter dependency on someone else? Talk to that man. But this man also has spiritual difficulties. Why? Because 
he only can go so far in the temple complex. The law forbade him from going past a certain point. He's able to get there and be in proximity to the temple itself, but he can't even go in to the court of Israel, which is where the men went. So you had the court of Gentiles, then you had the court of women, and then you had the court of Israel, which were the men. Right? He can only go so far. He can't even get into the court of the women. He's there in proximity to the presence of God. But the law said he can't go any further. He's a picture of those who dwell near the gates of God's presence but are never able to enter in because it's impossible for them to enter in on their own. And it's going to take a miracle from Jesus. This man knows his need. Look what it says in verse 2 again. They used to set him down daily at the gate of the temple. And he's at this gate. I'll get to the beautiful gate in a second. But he's aware of his need. He has to be carried from place to place. And to me, he's a picture of mankind before being born again. All of us are born sinners. All of us are born with the inability to approach near to God. All of us are, in one sense, born lame spiritually. And it's going to take a miracle from Jesus Christ to make one well. Now, obviously, this is a real man. He actually lived. But there's a picture here, an illustration of the inability of you and I to even go near to God on our own. He couldn't just get up and walk into the temple because it was impossible. Spiritually, mankind is born sinful and crippled spiritually. And we need somebody, and that's Jesus Christ, who gives life to the dead, strength and healing to the crippled. Amen? This is a, I think it's interesting, the first miracle of the church, the first miracle is Jesus transforming how this man walks. Isn't that what Jesus does for us? When you meet Jesus Christ, you no longer walk the same. I hope you never walk the same. That's why Jesus comes on this scene and says, follow me. What does follow mean? Follow actually means <laughs> to follow, right? Which implies walking. And unless Jesus Christ comes to a person and brings strength to those spiritual bones and calls them, they cannot move any closer. And they may be somebody, you may be here, somebody I'm watching online, you're around, the, you're around church all the time. You're around the things of God, the people of God, but you're like that lame, lame man, and you can only go so close. The problem, though, is this man knows his need, but many people don't even know that they're lame spiritually. How humbling is that to have to live in a place where, where you are so dependent on someone else? I think of the Johnny Erickson Toddy. You know, she's she's quadriplegic. You know, terrible accent. I can't imagine that. The, the learning or the from being a healthy young lady to being completely crippled and, and learning with that. And I know that obviously God is used to her, but there's that, that place of learning of how dependent you are on Jesus Christ to provide for you even the very next breath. Every single day, we ought to have the attitude that says, hey, Lord, we need you, ultimately. Amen? Spiritually, we are like this man. We were helpless. Paul says that for a while we were still helpless. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. I'm so glad that some turkey didn't come up to the guy and says, hey, you need to help yourself. God helps those who help themselves. You ever heard that? That's bad theology from Ben Franklin, okay? I'm sorry. God helps those. I understand the truth of what he's trying to say, but ultimately, 
God helps those who can't help themselves. And God helps those who realize, I can't help myself. I am in desperate need, God. I'm trying here. What am I supposed to do? You know? No, God doesn't help those. He helps those who know they can't help themselves. Otherwise, if they know they can help themselves, they're never going to cry out to God for help. The problem, though, here is this man has been in this condition so long. He's not going to expect anything more than a couple coins. He's, and, that, and that's where he's at. And of course, he's not expecting. But this is a different day. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Let me just describe this for you. This beautiful gate. There were nine gates that led from the court of the Gentiles into the temple itself. So the outer court of the Gentiles into the temple, until the main sanctuary area. The beautiful gate, there was two locations that were possibly. One possibility is from the outer, um, is from the court of the Gentiles into the court of the women. Another was from the court of the women into the court of, the, of Israel. This was called the beautiful gate because it was, it was made of Corinthian bronze. It looked like gold. It was a very large gate made of expensive bronze. It faced east. And just, it was above 15 steps. So this man is on one of these steps leading either into the court of the women or to the court of Gentiles. Josephus records that this gate was 75 feet high and 40, oh, I'm sorry, 60 feet wide. And it looked more beautiful than the gates that had silver and gold. It was it far exceed, it was this magnific, magnificent looking gate. Uh, bigger than, than the back wall here. Taller and wider. Okay. He's there to beg alms of those who are entering. Verse 3. Oh, by the way, giving alms, you see giving alms there? In order to beg alms, this was a central feature in Jewish teaching. The law encouraged helping people in need. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, it says, if there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers, if any one of your towns in your land which the Lord God has given you, you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he, act, uh, he, he lacks, that's Deuteronomy 15, 7. And that's even the context of the jubilee coming. Like, ju- your jubilee, all debts are... So it says, don't... don't uh, okay. If the year of jubilee is coming, and say, well, if I give this guy, if I lend him money, he's never, he's never going to pay me back, because don't do that. He says, open your hearts to him. So, so, so helping out the people in need was significant. Verse 3. And when Peter and John were about to, were about to go into the temple, he began to, re- to ask to receive arm, alms. And of course, the Greek indicates that he is asking repeatedly, which is probably his thing, but this man is asking because he needs it. But Peter and John are going up there to pray, Right? And here's what's interesting. As they're going up to pray, they don't ignore this man. They actually pay attention to this man. Sometimes you're going to be so caught up in what you have to do that you'll, you'll, you'll miss God's opportunities along the way. The lesson I see here with Peter and John is that they're always ready to minister. To them, they think the ultimate goal was going into the prayer is a big goal. But what if God were to send divine appoints to in your in your path along the way? You see that? We often are so concerned with what's happening in the church that we ignore the people outside the church along the way. Not you guys, but let's say in general, right? Remember, this is not a Sabbath. This is a regular day, which means that ministry doesn't happen just on Sundays or Saturdays. It happens every single day, which means that God may place lame people in your path every single day 
And if you're so caught up in your destination, you forget that the person in front of you is need your... Here's the thing is, every day is a chance for divine appointments to happen. By the way, Peter is going to address this man. Peter just got finished preaching to thousands, right? Acts chapter 2, 3,000 get saved. That's a big to do. But this is one man. Some of us are so caught up in the thousands that we forget the one. Right? Maybe if we woke up in the morning and said, Lord, would you lead me today? Let me not have such tightly, let me hold, not hold on so tightly to my plans. Now, I understand in our jobs we have things to do. But let's say, but let me become aware of the people that you have put in my path. And recognize those not as interruptions, but as divine appointments. The waitress at the restaurant. The customer at the store. The, the parent at the school. I think if we had the attitude to be ready, I think our Christian life would be a little more exciting. Don't you think? Maybe if we tuned out of our social media and pay attention to the people around us, we might be more aware of what's going on and say, Lord, would you lead me, whoever you have in my path. And maybe some days it'll be simple, you know, simple day. And, but you never know. And here's Peter and John who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who are not in seclusion at some monastery somewhere. No offense to monasteries. <laughs> I love quietness. But they're in the midst of everyday people. Yes, they live in a Jewish context, I understand that, but they're in the midst of people who need to hear the gospel. Amen? Verse 4. I told you I'd get to verse 10, so I'm going to keep my promise here. But when Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him, he said, look at us. Like I said, he is focusing on this one man. He could have, they could have just walked by this poor soul. But they walk and they say, hey, look at us. And the way it says in the Greek is, like, give us your attention right now. <laughs> this is going to be un... I imagine other people that gave to this man probably just kind of go like this. Just even, they probably didn't even look at the man. They probably just put coins in this thing and went on their way and thought, I did my alms for the day. Right? Here, Peter is going to talk and look at him. You know how it is when you look at someone in the eye, Right? Sometimes people are in need, we're afraid to look them in the eye, we're embarrassed. So we just kind of like, oh, we just help you out and just kind of go my way. But here Peter says, look at me, look at us. What? Like I said, Peter's great with reaching the thousands, but he's also great with, with reaching the one person. May God place one person in our path that we can at least share the gospel with. No doubt this man is thinking, oh, I'll just have no. But when, when Peter, uh, verse, four, verse 5, and he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Now, Peter knows what he wants to do. The man does not know what he wants to do, right? The man has reserved himself to just another day of expecting trinkets and coins in my jar. Peter has something else in mind. That's what a spirit-filled believer does, you know. I got something else in mind I want to bless you with, more than what you're expecting. Amen? Look at the boldness in that. Look, look at us. He began to give him his attention, verse 5. He's looking at them eagerly. He's probably expecting, hoping to receive money. Maybe he'll, he'll strike it a little bit better today. He began to give them this attention, expect to receive something from them. Verse 6, and I love this. Peter says, I do not possess silver and gold. Stop right there. If I'm the man, I hear that phrase, I'm thinking, oh, great. Why'd you tell me that? <laughs> I don't have any money. Silver and gold, another way of, of saying money. I don't have any money. I got nothing. To, I, I can't give you money. Silver and gold have I not, as the King James says. Material, of course, the, the, the disciples didn't possess much materially. But what I do have, I give to you. 
in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. Peter says, I don't have much to give materially, but what I do have, I'm going to share with you. You see the boldness in that? Peter, of course, who had been there with Jesus in the ministry when Jesus rose people from the dead and he healed the lame and he cast out demons. Peter was among, of course, the disciples and among the rest who were given authority to speak in the name of Jesus to cast out demons. And of course, they come back after they said, hey, Lord, even the demons are subject to your name. The exciting things, you know, it's exciting to see God moving. And you're like, wow, this is powerful. And Jesus says, of course, don't be excited about that. Be excited that your names are written in heaven. Peter understands that this man, though he is physically lame, he needs a lot more than just getting his money or his leg strain, which he will get. This man also needs to hear about Jesus. There's a principle here. God calls us to be distributors and not, not manufacturers. God calls us to give what he's given to us, not to try to manufacture something we can't give. That's the lesson he gave in the feeding of the 5,000. Twice he did that. He did that miracle twice. We are that basket. And we give and distribute what has been put in our basket, so to speak. The world is looking for, for answers, isn't it? And it's looking to politicians for answers. I hate to disappoint you. Politicians will let you down. Even the best of them will let you down. They won't make promises that will, they cannot keep because they're human beings. And yes, I understand we have to do politics. We have to do government. I get that. God has given us government as a gift to keep law and order and things like that. But as the church, we have... We have something that they cannot produce. We have something in Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that will save souls. We're not convinced of that, though. I see more people at, at rallies than I do at church. Y'all go crazy for rallies, for political rallies. What is a politician going to do? I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak on this. What is a politician going to do? He's going to pass laws. Hopefully they're good laws. But as a church, we have something that they don't even have. We have Jesus Christ. Yes. Has Jesus Christ made a difference in your life? Yes. Has he really made a difference in your life? I believe you. <laughs> Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, I give to you. Many of us are holding back what God has given to us. We don't realize the value of what we, we just have. We only have the, the, the news of eternal salvation <laughs> that not even the richest man in the world can ever buy for you. Problem with being with being rich is you die, and it goes to somebody else after you, right? We have the, what the world is looking for. We're, God is calling us to be like Peter and John, and, and giving the gospel, giving the love of Christ, the grace of Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. There was a, a, a um, John. I think it was John Stott told the story of. Uh, of a man who was walking in a in the in same asylum full of people who had all kinds of issues. And the director of the asylum says, have these people I could send home if they just learn how to forgive. Unforgiveness sent him to the same asylum and kept them there because they were bitter and unforgiven. God calls us to distribute what he's given to us. He's given us a knowledge of Jesus Christ, a relationship with him, the good, good news of the gospel. Anyway, where was I at? 
Verse 6. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. I just love that boldness. And there's faith there as well. Who has the faith there, though? Peter's going to say in verse 16, on the faith, look at verse 16. I'm, I'm, I know I'm not going to get there today, but look at this. Verse 16, on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this, this man, and the faith which is through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. My question is, whose faith was it that, that did this? Was it the man's faith? We don't know. The text doesn't tell us directly. I do know that there's faith in Peter, though, because you don't just walk up to a man who's crippled and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. I think sometimes Christians lack faith that they even have something powerful on their side. Why do we doubt? I'm not saying that this miracle has to be repeated left or right. I'm saying is that we ought to be walking with that boldness, Amen. that the Holy Spirit leads us to speak truth in life to people. He might not always call us to do physical healings. I, I, that's in God's territory. He's sovereign over that. But the boldness to speak forth something of encouragement to somebody. You just never know. If God places something on your heart that's encouraging, share it with somebody and don't hold it back because you'll never, that might save somebody's life. It might change their life. It may set them on a trajectory that goes a great direction. Verse 7, And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. I just love this. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. That means in the authority of Jesus Christ, this, is, this was, in verse 6, uh, a, a magical formula. This was because of relationship with Christ, they were speaking in the authority of Jesus Christ to do what Jesus did. And this man, of course, is healed. He gets immediate healing. Look what happens. Verse 8, and leaping up, he stood upright and began to walk. Let me just stop right there. That is a miracle on multiple levels. You hear about guys who are astronauts being in outer space for a year and they come back to Earth and they have to learn how to walk again because their muscles have atrophied, right? As this man's never had, never has had any muscle to walk with, right? He's got his muscles that are probably bare bones now. Not only is it a miracle of the bones, it's a miracle of the muscles, and it's a miracle of his dexterity to be able to walk, right? A miracle on multiple levels. This can't be faked. This was a complete healing from the Lord. He began leaping, and he stood upright and began to walk, something he's never been able to do, but now because of Jesus Christ, he has a walk. And he enters the temple for the first time. Can you imagine how many days he's outside wondering, hoping, what's going on inside? What's going on beside those? Earth? What are the men talking about? What's going well, how, what's, What does all this look like? Tell me about it. And now for the first time, he's entering in. Isaiah prophesied that in the Messianic age, the lame will leap like a deer. And no doubt, part of the message that Luke is trying to say is that, and, he, and, and Peter's going to get to, is that, that messing out of Asia started with Jesus Christ. And this is going on. What's the result? Look at this. He he's, enters the temple, verse 8, walking and leaping and praising God. How could you not get up and the man's dancing around? He doesn't say, I've been healed, I'll just be real somber. Jesus has made me so happy. I'm sorry, but if... Tell your feet that. <laughs> He's dancing and celebrating and praising the Lord. He knows what God has done for him. 
Oh, that we would know the same thing, amen? Every day we ought to be a day of rejoicing. You say, I don't like, well, I've been, I know you've gone through, all of us have gone through, some, but in the span of eternity, he's rescued us, saved us from hell, from eternal separation, from spiritual lameness and blindness and lostness. He's praising God. He's giving gratitude to God. I, I just imagine, and the, the scripture doesn't tell me. It says he's praising God. I imagine he's probably just making the scene. Can you see him? He's dancing around. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What is that noise? What's going on? That's that guy. All the people, verse 9, all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew him. See, when God does something in your life, you can't keep it down, can you? Now, sometimes it takes us a while to realize, but the significance, when it hits you, it says, I have a reason to praise God. Salvation alone is reason enough to praise God daily. This ought to be our response, because he met Jesus, and we met Jesus, if you're a believer in Christ. We were him, we were lame like him from birth, desperate in need, unable to provide for ourselves, having to, been, to be cared about. We were that, that man who needed to meet Jesus, and now we are that man that Jesus Christ has given us an actual new walk. You say, I'm a Christian. Well, <laughs> then it ought to be seen in, in how, we, how we walk. This man doesn't just leap, he runs, he praises, he's... And now he's a witness. Now he's a witness to those who knew him. They see something has radically happened. Look at verse 9. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him, that he was the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. They, read, they saw him. They knew it. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Jesus Christ can change anyone. You say, well, I've been going to church for so long and I prayed the prayer and this, that, and the other, and I don't see any change. Like, every day, just follow him. Sometimes there are people that get saved and it's a radical thing. It's like instant thing, radical thing, like you're different. And some people, you know there's a difference, but they're learning to learn how to walk in the ways of God. Either way, there's a difference of how that person's life has, has gone. All the while, the people in the courtyard are watching him. He's not talking to them. He's praising God, isn't he? And his praise and his change of life is a witness to the presence of Jesus Christ in life. They didn't, he didn't have to go and tell them. They, his life showed it to them. Do you know that same Jesus who did that for the, that man does it today for people today? Let's, get, let's figure about the past tense. That's great for that guy. He's with heaven. Jesus is in heaven. Today, Jesus Christ does that today for people everywhere. Do you believe that? I still believe God does miracles. The scripture says he hasn't changed. <laughs> and it seems like the point of the story is he's passing on his ministry to those who would go and do likewise. Maybe not to the same intensity as the apostles. Maybe not, but maybe. That's up to God. I can't control God. I can ask God to, to change a person's life and heal them. I can do that. I would, I would, I, my, 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 um, where I fail is the boldness of Peter. <laughs> do I actually believe that God wants to help somebody out? Maybe that's maybe between me and God, but I still believe God is one who changes lives. A person may re remain physically lame all their life, but they may be spiritually alive, leaping and bouncing off the walls, right? Does God call us to care for those who are in need? Absolutely, right? Let's just, sometimes, sometimes, you know, God, he says in James, hey, you say you have faith, well, 
prove it with your works, right? And if you somebody in, somebody in need, how can you say, God bless you, and not help them out? Of course, God calls us to do that. Jesus will say to the, to the sheep on his right, enter my, my, the presence of my father, because I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me in prison. I was naked, you clothed me. All this stuff. When, Lord, when? You did it to at least my brother, you did it to me. Now, some people say, well, that's social gospel. But that's, just, that's just caring for people. That won't save that person, but at least it'll show the, the love of Christ to that person. Are we called to that? Absolutely. Will every person we pray for get healed? No, not necessarily. But every soul has the opportunity of getting saved and meeting Jesus Christ personally and having their life changed. And we have that. And maybe we're like Peter and John going about our day. And it's an ordinary day. And we meet somebody who's having already, it's a waitress somewhere, somewhere, who's struggling. She's a single mom. Her husband's left her. And she's working two jobs, barely making ends meet. And you say, what's your name? How can I pray for you today? And they just open up. That's just a simple. Or somebody you work with. Your neighbor. Who calls you out of the blue. Why would they call me? Because they know you have Jesus and they, they're asking questions and you've been praying for them. And so they call you up and you're there as a light to them. I don't have the solution you're looking for, but what I do have, I do have Jesus Christ to give to you. Amen? I just love this. <coughs> this man's walk was changed because Jesus Christ he gives people new life. He actually does heal brokenness. Stop trying to fix your brokenness on your own. You've tried and it doesn't work. And maybe God allows you to, to remain, to have some brokenness in your life, to keep you dependent of, on, upon Him. I'm going to stop here. I told you I would only get to verse 10. Thank God, <laughs> because the rest, of the, the rest of the passage is a lot more to dig into. But praise the Lord, it's the same God we serve as they served in the first century, amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how you change lives. Thank you, Lord, that you call us. Maybe we don't get to minister to thousands, but Lord, we maybe get to minister to one. Maybe some of us are being used in people's lives with our, our knowledge. And maybe hearts are being changed, Lord. If it, Father, I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who needs, first of all, salvation, Lord, that they would place their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, that you would grant that, that person new life and salvation. And Lord, maybe, Lord, would you grant us, those of us who are believers, boldness, to be sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit, to be used by you in powerful ways. Lord, help us to, to listen and obey what your Spirit puts in our heart. Maybe there's somebody we're supposed to call or text and reach out to, but we've been putting it off. Or maybe we're like that broken man or broken person. Lord, I pray for supernatural healing for you to bring wholeness to that person. God, we pray that our lives will be lived as a testimony of the work of Jesus Christ in our lives. That people would see that and wonder what in the world has happened. God, I pray your blessing uh, on the rest of our time together today. Fill us with your spirit and lead us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.